a kind of a popular theory out there that the 24 elders that we see in beginning in Revelation chapter 4 are actually uh, maybe the Old Testament saints who've been resurrected and now now are part of this uh, council that uh, sits in front of the Lord. We're going to look at that today and what I'm hoping to show you is that the Old Testament saints are actually part of the body, part of the bride. They're part of the church. They're not a separate class of people from you and I today who are part of the church. And we're going to take a look at that and uh, I hope you'll be able to see then that the 24 elders actually comprise uh, all the people of God, um, Old Testament and New, and uh, this will be a lot of fun. We're going to be looking primarily at uh, Hebrews 11 and Hebrews chapter 12. A lot of you may know uh, Hebrews chapter 11. It's uh, sort of called the Faith Hall of Fame, and it uh, lists a number of Old Testament people who are noted for having faith in God, and particularly for actions that they did, like being willing to sacrifice your son. And, and they're held up as examples for us of people who had faith. They didn't receive uh, the promises yet because they're waiting for a future fulfillment of the promises that God has has for them. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old received divine approval. By faith we understand that the world was created by the Word of God so that what is seen was made out of things which do not appear and uh, goes into Abel offering a, a sacrifice that was acceptable, um, Enoch being taken so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. And it's a very interesting passage, and it was attested to him before he was taken that he pleased God. And then it goes right into this verse, and without faith it is impossible to please him. So faith is a necessary requirement uh, to please God. And what is faith? Faith is um, believing in things that you don't see. So it says here in the very first verse, we understand that the world was created by the word of God. What was seen was made out of things which do not appear. So faith is one of those things that we don't see, but when it's activated, things appear. People who lived in the Old Testament, if they had faith, okay, they pleased God. People who live uh, on this other side of the cross, if we have faith in Christ and in the promises of God, we please God. What God is looking for in um, the people that he wants to be close to him are people who trust him and people who love him and people who have faith in him and his word. People who have faith, um, whether on the other side of the cross or this side of the cross, are very special to God. Faith is an uncommon thing, okay? Not that many people choose to place their trust in God. Now, here's the difference between people who are alive now and have been alive these last 6,000 years and people who are going to be alive during the millennium. If you're here in the millennium, you're going to see Christ. You're going to see the Lord. You're going to probably see angels. You're going to see glorified people. And there is no faith required, okay, because you will see these things, okay? You will see the Lord. No faith required. People who live in an era where they don't see the Lord, they have his commands, they trust him, they put all of their eggs in his basket, this pleases God. This is the people that he is not ashamed to call them his sons. All right, so we're going to take a look at Abraham. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place where he was to receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was to go. All right, this is that element of uncertainty here. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Okay, so what's the city that Abraham is looking forward to? It's certainly not uh, Jerusalem on earth. The city he's looking forward to 
is the heavenly city of New Jerusalem. Um, verse 13 talks about all, all the people, Abel and um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, um, Enoch, and Noah. And it says about these people, all these died in faith, not having received what was promised and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear they're seeking a homeland. If they'd been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And the city that God has prepared for them is the same city that he's prepared for us, those of us who are part of the Bride of Christ. If you still have any questions about whether these people actually were believers in um, the Messiah, I just want you to take a look at what Hebrews says um, about Moses. It says, By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered abuse, suffered for the Christ, greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Hebrews 11 goes on to talk about all kinds of other people, not mentioning them all by name, but people who um, were willing to sacrifice, willing to die even for the faith that they had in the Lord. And in verse 39 of chapter 11, it says, and all these, though well attested by their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had foreseen something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. The Old Testament saints are not resurrected before us. They don't have any of their inheritance before we get it. We're all getting the same thing, and they're not going to get it ahead of us. It says, apart from us they shall not be made perfect. So there is no Old Testament resurrection of, of people um, who are now glorified and sitting in the presence of God. Uh, that isn't how this works. Yeah. Hebrews tells us that since we are surrounded by this great cloud of people who are witnesses to the faithfulness of God, that we're supposed to lay aside every weight and every sin that clings so closely and run with perseverance the race that's set before us. And that's one of the things that's really necessary if you are part of the family of faith is this, uh, number one, believing in things you cannot see based on the promises of God. And the second thing is persevering in these things and not growing weary or um, becoming faint-hearted. It's uh, perseverance until the end. In Hebrews chapter 12, we have this uh, verse that's really precious. And the writer of Hebrews is making a contrast between Mount Sinai, which where the law was given and there was all kinds of earthquakes and rumblings and it was a very scary thing, and uh, Mount Zion, the place where the New Jerusalem is. And what he says here is, but you've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, to a judge who is God of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks more graciously than the blood of Abel. And verse 25, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less shall we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. His voice then shook the earth, but now he is promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, as of what has been made, in order that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and let us thus offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. All right, so this is the exhortation that there is coming a time 
when the heavens and the earth will be shaken and everything that is not of God is going to be destroyed. And I believe this refers to uh, the destruction of the old heaven and the old earth and the creation of a new heaven and the new earth along with the new Jerusalem. If we go to Revelation 21, we read about New Jerusalem coming down from heaven. It, verse 10 says, And in the Spirit he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. And it had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed on the three east gates, on the north three gates, the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the walls of the city had twelve foundations, and on them the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So, so here we have New Jerusalem, and it's made of Old Testament people and New Testament people. The foundation um, is the twelve apostles, uh, have their names on that, and the uh, 12 tribes of Israel have a name over each door that goes into the city. And what this, I believe, is, is telling us is that it's Old Testament believers as well as New Testament believers who are part of the bride, the body, the um, city of God, the New Jerusalem. And all of us will be um, either raptured or resurrected at the man-child rapture, the Bible portrays this uh, baby, now a mature man, uh, represented by the 24 elders seated on thrones uh, in the throne room of heaven. I also believe that it is these 24 elders, these uh, who represent the church, the body, that will be uh, judging people in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, where it says, And then I saw thrones and seated on them, were those to whom judgment was committed. And this is after the tribulation, just as the millennium is beginning. We have these thrones that are placed. The only other um, people that we know of who are sitting on thrones in the book of Revelation are the 24 elders. They're seated on thrones. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, verses 2 and 3, uh, he says, uh, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more matters pertaining to this life? And of course, Paul was um, rebuking these people for having lawsuits with each other. What he's telling us is that the church is going to be judging the people who come out of the tribulation. We're also going to be judging angels. That is the role of the church where kings and priests and one of those things that we do is uh, exercise the judgment the righteous judgment uh, that's assigned to us by Christ if it was Christ doing the judging it would be a throne okay there was a throne but as it is there are thrones so uh, we'll be doing it with the likes of Moses and Abraham and Isaac and David and Daniel uh, Rahab Esther Ruth wonderful people we're all part of the same body. We all have the promises of God. If you walk in faith, these things are yours. All right? The promises of God are yes and amen. So I hope this has encouraged you. I hope you'll give me a thumbs up and uh, share this video with someone you think might um, appreciate its contents. Uh, leave a comment or a question. And until the next video, I pray you'll have a very, very blessed day.